Hi, welcome to If These Pages Could Talk. Today we are discussing using location and legacy in a story, what an editor wants from her writers, reworking a previously released book for new publication, starting a self-publishing press and more. So I am Kirsten Marcel, author and adventurer into history. Please welcome my co-host. Savannah Storm, romance writer. And we have a treat for you today because we have another author-editor duo. So how about we start with our author? Would you please introduce Hi, yourself? Um, sorry, yep, I'm Kenise Kerr and uh, I'm a former university academic and primary school teacher. I'm um, married and I live with my husband of 47 years. We have no pets, but plenty of cat imagery around the place. <laughs> that. And her editor is here. Yeah, I'm Jody Christensen and... I'm the former editor with Champagne Books, um, and I had the pleasure of editing Kenise's book that we're going to talk about today. One of them, not both, but and I'm also an author. I write time travel romance and dark speculative fiction. Awesome. And Jody, as if you've watched before, as you know, was editor on my first book. So I'm really excited to have her back. And I've talked to Kenise before, but now we're getting to do like more of a one-on-one. -on -one, so I'm I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. All right, so for our, our warm up and our icebreaker today, I've asked everybody first, um, what time is it where you are? Um, it, it is almost noon where I'm at and it's a very cold winter day. <laughs> Can you it's, tell six you? it's six o'clock in the morning here and it's quite a warm autumn's day. So? 9 p.m. in South Africa, and it's still summer. <laughs> and it is 2 p.m. here in Albany, and it is also cold and was snowing earlier. So I, I wanted to ask that so people um, realize how special it is that we were able to somehow all get on an interview <laughs> together. <laughs> 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 and, and just how exciting it is that, you know, we are talking across so many countries and and so get to share so many wonderful ideas. I love it. So I asked for our warm up if we could do a show and tell. And everyone is asked to either show or just tell us about something unique to, you know, where you come from or um, to, to you and, and where you come from. So um, who would like to go first? Well, I took it from uh, the, the unique things that I, I, I've collected that I use in my stories. Um, and so I've, um, I've collected the mint oil that I got um, in Cairo that appears in the story, but not in the way that the lovely man who sold it to me recommended. Jodie knows more about that. Um, the, uh, the the little perfume bottles that also appear in the, in the story. Um, what else have I got here? Oh, oh, yes, around the back here. There's some of that cat imagery that I was talking about. And the, the collections of the perfumes that appear in the um, in in the second story. So we'll talk more about nice. those later. And of, and of course, I've got one of the kilts hanging up behind me. <laughs> oh yeah, that's awesome! Yeah. Oh, I love it. That that's so that's so cool. Well, then I if if you guys don't mind, I'll jump in next yeah, with mine. Ahead. Okay, because I come, um, I was originally from Saratoga, I'm Albany now, but upstate New York, we're known for our apples, but Saratoga is known also, it's health, it's horses, and it's history, so my actual show and tell is a piece of gravestone, and this is um, from my great, 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 great grandfather, uh, David Grauberger, he is mentioned in my second book, and his, um, the, his gravesite, he fought in the American Revolutionary War, um, but his, the church burnt down around 1800, and so the graveyard is completely unkept. And one of my relatives invited me to go clean it up. His stone had broken and fallen. We stood it back up and reburied it, um, but we couldn't. There was this chip, and until we could actually repair it, I didn't want it to disappear and get damaged. So um, I have kept it, and I, I, I like to hold it sometimes, and, and you know, say, "Okay, Grandpa, let's do some more writing tonight." <laughs> um, That's great. I love yeah. it. I'm and happy to hear you're not a, one of those people that steals random bits of stone. 
off my head. <laughs> um, I can just picture you going to graveyards going, oh, this is a nice piece. This is a nice piece. You know, it's funny. I'm so not, I was very nervous about taking this. And my, my one cousin is like, it's fine. It's fine. She's like, I, you know, you want to take it with you. And, and that was so no, I'm not. I'm actually kind of superstitious about that. <laughs> but I really, I was like, I just don't want this to get lost until right. fix it. I'm trying to Wait. reach mine. Yeah. Wait, that's not it. Okay. Hang on. I thought it was in a different box than what it's in. So, <laughs> okay. So I don't know that mine's necessarily unique to Utah as as like Utah the state, but um, okay. I collect these skeleton keys wow. and these awesome. came from antique stores in Utah. So every time we go on just a local road trip somewhere, I'll stop at little antique stores and I find these skeleton keys in there and I always, I always buy them because my my books, my time travel romance have the keys in them. So yeah. I've got quite a little collection now. Um, and they all came from, from Utah, it's which perfect. I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, oh, they're gorgeous. <laughs> so, and they are meaningful to my book. Um, and like I said, maybe not so much unique to Utah, but I got them all here. Yeah. So they're special to me. And then I, I keep them in this little... Uh, ship box that I found beautiful <laughs> also at an antique store can you see it oh yeah it's gorgeous wow. yeah so it's it I don't know how old it is like the box itself the little seal on it says yeah. 1885 though so that's cool I like it I, it stays on my desk kind of as writing inspiration um I used to keep it open but then my grandson would come in and steal the keys so and play <laughs> with them <laughs> and that's not good <laughs> yeah so <laughs> oh I yeah. love it that's perfect I have a stuffed rhino <laughs> they're precious to South Africa obviously that's probably awesome. to the world and it's a money box oh, and it was given to me by a fellow author um as a 50,000 word NaNoWriMo prize Oh, so, because nice. we do the prizes for NaNoWriMo, you know, get yeah. the word card, get a prize. And this was the 50,000. And I love it. Um, For my book, though, my husband and I, as part of date night, are painting. So I'm going to be painting this. I don't know if I can see it. You can see. Yeah, it's yeah, gonna, yeah. This is step oh, two, I think. No. <laughs> uh, this is a character. Uh, this one isn't a character at all, actually. Where's the other one? This one's a character from Aya of Silver. It's a oh. woman with a um, crossbow that we get to paint in two Tuesdays. And then here is my latest character. She's holding up a sword. Oh, so oh, the fun yeah. thing is the bases. So this is why we did it. So we can do the bases. This one's going to have grass everywhere. This one's going to be on solid rock. Um, and this one, if you can look at it uh, carefully, let me move it, is wood planks. Oh, wow. Oh, she's in the tavern. So these are all going to get painted. And I'll get to show it at some other show and tell. All right. As, as we, as we oh. do that. So that's nice. something we're doing together. I love it. I, I like how I think every writer has something special because we all take inspiration from everywhere, everything. And Ooh, it's fun to see what, what authors have as their key picks and their their inspiration in their house. So Jody and, and Canis, how did you two get connected as author writer? Um, from my end, it was, I, I believe she just was in need of an editor and I was approached and asked if I would be interested. And so I, I asked if I could read the first few chapters so I could see if it was a book I was interested in reading and working on. And I read the first three chapters and I really liked it. I have a big weakness for Scottish stories, though, <laughs> and her hero in the story is Scottish. So I, I really just um, was interested, and I agreed to, to um, edit her book. Oh, cool! And Canis, yeah. Oh, and how, what was um, Canis when you? How did you get introduced to Jody? Like maybe the first interaction you had with her. 
Uh, I had a, an email from Cassie um, suggesting mm -hmm. that Jody would be my editor. And then I heard from Jody and she said, uh, so is this a uh, is this a paranormal story? Because this giant, who is he? And I because I, I described um, <laughs> I remember Lockie, that. the main character as a giant. Did she Katrina is standing in the cafe uh, confronted by this giant? And but mm -hmm. I don't say it's a, a giant of a man until a bit later <laughs> on. So it was a wee bit confusing. Mm. <laughs> I do do remember it. that, yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> um, I do want to just invite our audience, if, if you do want to learn a little more about how Jody is an editor for our publisher, publisher Champagne Book Group, um, chose authors to go back to our first episode and check that out because Jody did such a great job explaining it. Um, but Tinas, we're talking about your book, and I don't want to even try and say it because I'm afraid I'm going to say it wrong. The Salignac Legacy. Thank you. Um, uh, this this is uh it's a story of Lockie, who's a young laird, and the Australian waitress Katrina. And Katrina makes a secret, uh, makes a pate to a secret family recipe. Now, what she doesn't know is that uh, back in Kilbra, back in Scotland, um the the McKells have depended on the pate recipe to provide uh, employment for people in the community. And the last pate recipe holder has died. Now, the, the recipe is handed down through the matriarchal line from way back from the days of, um, so, gosh, my goodness me, from Salignac, Simone de Salignac, who came across um, to Scotland with the French. So she's the last one who has this pate recipe and uh, she doesn't know that it belongs in Scotland and they don't, the Scots don't know that it's, it's in Australia until one of Lockie's um, great aunts discovers the flavour when she's visiting a cafe in Melbourne. And she races back to Scotland and says, I found the recipe. It says, I found the pate. <laughs> and so Lockie comes to Australia to try to convince Katrina to go back to Scotland and teach them how to make pate again. Anyway, so, and there's lots of ups and downs. And um, uh, so eventually Katrina goes to Scotland. There's a few black moments. She comes back to Australia. And uh, Lockie has to decide whether to stick with his pride or follow her and, and, um, capture her because after all they have fallen deeply in love <laughs> that's awesome um so jody since you were her editor why don't i just hand the virtual microphone over to you and um okay. let's walk through this book okay well i'm i mean i had some some questions that were uh things that interested me the most because I have not been a world traveler. So when I read your stories, Kenise, I love that I feel like I get to be a world traveler because your books go everywhere. <laughs> like <laughs> your characters travel, they go places. And I love that. So I I just wondered if you could talk about what inspires you to use these locations. I mean, are these places that you've been to personally that inspire you or is it just what suits your story? Um, well, I love to travel. Um, I, I grew up in a small town um, in central in southern Queensland, and when I was in year five, um, my teacher came back from a trip to Denmark, and it was the first time that I realised that the world was accessible mm -hmm. to people I knew. Mm. They weren't just people out beyond; they were people I knew. Yeah. And so that developed a passion in me then um, that I would travel. And fortunately, I have a husband who's quite prepared to do that. And uh, if he gets a spare moment, he plans a trip. You know, he does that. <laughs> um, so, yes, a lot of these places are uh, where I visited. But for Kelbra, uh, it's actually a location that I haven't visited. It was one um, that I wanted to be sufficiently remote but uh, commutable to Edinburgh but would be affected by um, weather conditions um, and 
would have very limited employment opportunities. So I, I just picked a spot in the in the highlights and used that. Um, it's so well the, written. You would never know that you've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have been to Edinburgh, so and I have been to Scotland, so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I, I, I could get the general idea right. of it's just that particular town. Um, I notionally thought of Pitlochry, Pit and um, so. I must, it's on my bucket list. I must get there one of these days. Yeah. The Scotland is also on my bucket list. So <laughs> someday, <laughs> someday I have a big bucket list. <laughs> Good. It gives you something to live for, right? All those yes, things to yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Goals. <laughs> I'm just curious before we, we continue, um, Canis, do you have a favorite part of Scotland or favorite memory from when you were there? I loved the road between um, Inverness and Port, Port William. So across down along um, Loch Ness. Mm, um, oh, that's, yeah. that's really beautiful because you've got the mountains and you've got the lake and it's, it's just um, phenomenal for me. I love Edinburgh and uh, we've been to the military tattoo in the castle there several times. Um, in various weather conditions um, and for quaint I love Oban on the west coast it's, it's a it's a fishing area and you can walk through the town it's, it just feels um, quaint this is probably the best word I can come up with for that yeah, yeah it's gorgeous there um, my husband and I honeymooned throughout England Ireland Wales Scotland and um, it was pouring rain. So when we went to Loch Ness, we didn't get to do a tour, but we sat alongside the lock in the car and we're like, is that, is that? <laughs> Did you see Nessie? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want Nessie, no, lots of raindrops. But you're right, it's such a gorgeous, gorgeous corridor. So, mm -hmm. okay, back to you, Jody. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question I had for you, well, I I love this particular series. You incorporate these legacies into your stories and I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about where you got the idea to do that and and how that how that came about because like each story in this series has a kind of legacy well it wasn't so much the the legacy wasn't the first idea um what, the story for Salignac um was basically a mishmash of experiences um, while, uh, while my husband was working at the university in Inverness one day, I took a trip out to Culloden Field, oh, um, nice. where that great battle was, where the, the Scots were defeated by the English. Um, and it was during my tour of that that I was reminded how much French influence there was in Scotland at that time. Now, that in itself didn't mean anything. And then we came back to Australia and we were enjoying pate at a French restaurant in Melbourne one night. And again, that didn't mean anything. It was a lovely pate, really nice. Um, but somehow these things collided overnight and in the morning, this story has started to form. Um, so it, and it was the part of the story was with the, the history and the French and the pate, and I thought, well, maybe there is a, a particular um, legacy that might be drawn from that. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that one started. And because that was a legacy, then the ones that have come since have also been legacy stories, or so the one the one that's come since and the two that will come after. Mm. And see, I love that. I love that you're doing kind of legacy type stories because it kind of gives a an added depth to the family dynamics and and it and it gives you opportunity to have some drama and some intrigue and some interesting historical things in your stories, which is really fun because your stories are contemporary, but you still get that little flavor of historical information in there, which I love. So it's a really good mix. <laughs> It adds authenticity. It does. It really does. So, have you ever made the pate in that in that book, <laughs> in your story? A, ver a version of it. A version and, of it. Yes, 
and it was it was that that um, prompted a whole lot of other things. So what I I couldn't get hold of goat's milk at the time, so I used cow's milk, and my whiskey wasn't laced with lavender, though I do use lavender in other things, like I use lavender in ice cream and so forth. Um, but uh, yes, the, I I've made the pa chicken liver pate several times, mm -hmm. and um, okay. yep. And my husband really enjoys it. I'm not such a fan, but he loves it, so I make it. <laughs> well, that's fun. <laughs> Do you think you'll um, because you have on your website from when we were all together in Cupcakes and Cocoa your recipe for the biscuits? Do you think you'll ever put the pate on your website for us? I could do that yes no problem yep. yeah that would that would be amazing um so <laughs> you have this great story in your bio <laughs> about your, um <laughs> when you told your husband <laughs> what uh the, the story idea was and um do, do you remember what he said to you oh yes he said y you can't write a romance about chicken livers <laughs> Uh, this was this was the one afternoon when we were having uh, some of the pate with pre-dinner drinks, and I said, "Well, you know, I've got this story idea that you know about pate and the French and legacy and so forth." And he said, "You can't write a romance about chicken livers." And I said, "Why not?" He said, "People don't want to read about awful. How's that romantic?" <laughs> now, to, to be fair, you know he. We'll talk about my stories a lot and we'll talk about my characters as if they're in the next room. Um, and he's pointed out plot holes that I hadn't even th seen. Um, so I, I actually value his input, but this time I was stubborn and I just went ahead and wrote the story about Pate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great that your husband, um, you have that kind of sounding board with him that's very... Uh... That's very helpful. Jealous. <laughs> yeah, me too. So <laughs> jelly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My husband's like, I'm not reading your stuff. Like, <laughs> well, uh, the thing is, um, David hasn't read my stuff until, well, he still hasn't read it as such. But when I submitted the most recent story with the final edits to Jody, he said, "Well, maybe I should, um, maybe I should listen to it." So he downloaded the PDF from mine, and he's had the computer reading it to him, which has some interesting pronunciations. It does. <laughs> he came home and he said, um, "So who's Michael?" And I said, "Michael, I don't have a Michael in the book." Michael, the computer was calling Mikel Michael. Um, mm -hmm. And they cannot um, cannot pronounce any of the uh, Scottish words. Cannot pronounce any of the French words. So he's had to make up a few ideas along the way, um, and he's had to get used to the idea of what he calls some of the shenanigans that are going on, uh, like what happens with the mint oil. But you'll have to read the story to find out about that. Um, so yes, it, because he can listen to it while he's on his bike ride, he's reading. Um, he's now re he's read Bolia and he's now reading Salignac, so in reverse order. <laughs> it is pretty funny to listen to it on the computer like that because you get no emotion, there's no inflection no. in the dialogue. Some words it just doesn't know how to pronounce, and it it is pretty funny <laughs> at times. <laughs> But it, it is, it, it's fascinating to hear the computer try and it's such a yeah. useful, you know, we've talked about this before, it's such a useful tool for revising because it does point out, you know, what's structurally wrong with your story and your sentences. The sex does, scenes are like, the worst. Yeah, the oh yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> if you listen to if the you sex like me, like I read, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Siv. Sorry, Siv. Go ahead. That's fine. <laughs> I was just gonna say I read so fast that if we if I listen to it, it like forces me to slow down. But I speed up the reading the talking on there because it goes so slow that I can't stand it. So I speed it up. So it sounds like a chipmunk. <laughs> it's a little funny. <laughs> so emotionless, high pitched sex scenes. <laughs> uh, red <laughs> flag, red <laughs> chipmunk, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Good fun. <laughs> <Hannigans>. <laughs> exactly. that, sounds, 
It's like a whole new subgenre in romance <laughs> right there. Right? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh my gosh. So, so Kanis, this is part of a, um, you have a sequel coming, right? That you're working on or you turned it yes. in? Uh, yes, uh, we finished the final edits on the Bolio Birthright. Mm -hmm. um, now the this the, the Bolio Birthright, the characters are Lockie's sister Iona and his best friend Enzo. Mm -hmm. um, and that one is due out in November, I think, Jody, is that right? I last I heard, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure of, of the schedule and where it's at right now, but that's what I had heard was was yes, in I the fall. So, I think it's yeah. November. Yeah. That's cool. Do we see crossovers of the characters from the first book into the second? Oh, yes, yes, because it's um it's Katrina, Lockie's wife, who comes racing downstairs and says to Iona, um, guess who's coming to the christenings, which are the christenings of their their uh, twin daughters. Mm -hmm. And of course, I Iona and Enzo have this um, history uh, where he deliberately called her by her twin sister's name on the night of her 18th birthday when he kissed her. Um, mm -hmm. So he has his own reasons for doing that. So they have this gnarly history. So she's, she's not at all impressed that Enzo's coming to the christenings. Uh, but that sets off a chain of events um, which brings them together and the story goes from there. Mm. And that one's around um, perfumes. Mm -hmm. So Enzo is a perfumier and uh, Iona is trying to establish her business as a goat's milk soap maker, wanting some information about fragrances and so forth. That's cool. You And you had just talked on your website as part of your blog about going down a rabbit hole of research that led you to learning about how plants talk to each other. So how did you um, get there? Well, I was already researching plants for the perfume story. Um, and then we just happened to, we, we, there's this lovely garden area just down the road here, what, a 40 minute drive that we go to fairly off, often. And it's got lovely big crystals and, and the lovely gardens that you walk through. So it's a new agey sort of place. And it's a great place to just go and, and relax and chill out. And on this particular day, they, followed a presentation on the singing bowls, which you would realise is really beautiful and, and toneful, with a, a discussion about how plants communicate. And I thought, oh, I don't want to miss this. So we sat down and um, the, she had the plants wired up with uh, electrodes and showed how when she used a stimulus, either a, a chime or um, a sharp word, soft music, um, the plants responded differently through the electrodes. And over time, you couldn't do it in the time that we had available there, but over time, the plants learned to respond to the sounds that they created and would huh. repeat them. Sort of like a baby looking in a mirror to say, oh, are you still there? Are you still there? Um, and so it's it's difficult to explain, but mm -hmm. the bottom line is the plants learn to recognize the sounds that they created. They learn to recognize the sounds that the plant next door created, and they would communicate sort of like that. They would they had some sort of precognitive sense that if they were going to be under attack, they would start to get all uh, quivery and, and shaky, the, the tone. So it's got to the point that I, I now feel guilty going downstairs to um, to cut the herbs for dinner because, you know, they know I'm coming. <laughs> you know, as, as, in the, as, as, as it says in the story, there's a whole lot of information out there on how plants communicate and, um, and how... Um, they they can protect themselves they can band together to protect themselves from marauding animals and so forth by producing excess tannins that the animals can't handle uh, so they're killing off the animals that are trying to kill them off so it's, <laughs> it's it's fascinating stuff and there's universities around the world um undertaking research on it so yeah google the secret life of plants you'll find heaps of stuff 
That's so fascinating. That is. You never know where, the, where the, yeah, you never know where that research is going to take scientists either, like what uses it'll end up having that'll, you know, I don't know, save the world or, or you there's never a, know. There's a scene in Good Omens where his, his one plant, Crawley's one plant, has got a blemish on it. And the only reason why they flourish is because he is brutal. If there is not a plant that's growing properly, he kills it in front of them and he yells at them. This is what you do. Watch this. If you do not grow. And then he goes, Fuck. and those plants <laughs> shine. <laughs> and I'm just picturing Kenneth is going around. Now it's time to cut the herbs. <laughs> I would not be surprised. I know that's a Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett togetherness, but I I would not be surprised if Neil Gaiman knew that. (laughs) Right. Okay, Canis, I'm going to turn it over to you, and um, let's let's have you chat with uh, Jody so we can learn a little bit about her as an editor and and her process with you. Okay, so. Um, well, I've lost my questions for Jody. Here we are. <laughs> um, so, Jody and Seb, if you like, um, what's the one aspect of my writing or others' writing that you'd like to see eliminated before the manuscript gets to you? Like, for me, as you know, it's independently moving body parts. <laughs> The hand flies up in one direction and the eyes it sort of drop up to the floor and that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, that reminds me, before I answer, um, when we started working on your second book, you had said, oh, I'm so glad to work with you again. I really miss you telling me that she can't see that about herself. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that? Which was really funny because, yeah, those point of view problems. <laughs> but no, for me, like with anybody's work, I think the biggest thing that I see is is people using the character names so much that it's they're everywhere and like when you I don't know I think because I look at it from a different from an editing standpoint like when I listen to people talk you don't you don't say people's names all the time every line of dialogue you say to somebody you don't say their name and and then you'll get a story in from from an author and it's like hi Bob how are you I'm great you know, Jack, how are you? Hey, Bob, let's go get some coffee. Thanks, Jack. I'd love coffee. Like people don't talk like that. (laughs) Like the overuse of the names. I I wish that, that we could any, anybody like, like really think about how often you say somebody's name in reality and, and, and try to cut that back because in your stories, it's just that repetition. It, it really is distracting. And when I read, I want to, like absorb the story. I don't want to be focused on seeing the name 25 times on a page. That's really, for me, a big distraction. So you were really good about not doing that. (laughs) So I wouldn't say this applies to you specifically, but just for any, any work, you know, in the broad scope of of people I've worked with and, and books I've edited, that's like my biggest (laughs) thing I wish authors would would pull back on a little. <laughs> Seb and I are, are planning on doing some some shorts and I know this is going to be one of her, <laughs> her uh, soapbox moments. I don't know if that's right. Can we, can we, can we leash you a little bit and, and- <laughs> Just choose one, just choose one is what you're saying. <laughs> Starting your novel in, with dialogue. <laughs> I, biggest I pet pet. Yeah. <laughs> why is that writers want to know because i mm-hmm. don't care about the character enough to care what they're saying i'm not interested take us yeah. take five minutes before or five minutes after what they say and it's usually something bland like good morning or um, how was your day or please pass me the salt i'm like gee that's riveting thanks you've just wasted <laughs> your first sentence uh-huh. Your first sentence, the one that's going to grip us, you've just mm-hmm. wasted. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, because that first sentence is so, so, so important. Okay, cool. It is. <laughs> Candice, back to you. Okay. Um. So, editors, 
what genre do you prefer to read on your own time? And as an editor, how do you deal with uh, genres that you'd never choose to read? Um, okay, so I read almost everything. I have a few a few genres that aren't really my my thing. Um, fantasy stories are hard because some of them I really, really like a lot. And some of them I'm just not interested in. And and so it's it's like, I don't know. I've had to actually say before, I might not be the best editor for this project because I don't read stories about fairies, for example. I don't read fairy stories. I'm probably not the editor that you want if you've written a story about fairies. And, and as an editor, it's hard to have to say that to somebody, especially if they're like, Oh, I'm really looking forward to working with you. And I really, really want to work with you to have to say, I'm not sure I can do the best job for you that, that you and your story deserve, you know? And, but sometimes you have to do that if you know that's a limitation for you. Now I love time travel stories. I love romance stories. And on the darker side, I really like um, end of the world stories, post-apocalyptic fiction, I think is really fun to read. I love survival stories. That's the thing. I love stories about survival. I could I could read and edit those all day long. I love them. And I, I write them too. So I don't know. It It is hard though with a genre that, that you don't love or a type of character. So, so what, Jody? What gives you the greatest satisfaction in the finished work? Um, you know, when, like, for instance, when we started yours, I had read the manuscript before we started editing. So, as I'm doing the first read, it's just a straight read through, and I'm trying to get an idea of the the plot and this the story arc and the character arcs and stuff like that. And you know, your mind is making little notations along the way, and 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 then you really start on the editing process. And then when I do that final read through after we've gone through and done all of the work and I can see that your your plot is really just tight and good and that your characters shine, that is so satisfying. It really is so satisfying to me to just see everything come together and to realize like you've worked so hard, I've worked hard and that you know, we've reached this place where we're ready for the next step. Like to me, as like the best feeling. <laughs> I love that. Have you the same process, Seb? Um, when it goes through copy editors and I don't have any response. When there's just silence. <laughs> oh, excellent. Because yeah. that is that is the mountain. Uh -huh. the as an author when I get copy edits back I'm devastated I'm like why did you sign my book if you hate it so much <laughs> you know <Right? laughs> so as an editor when it comes back and she's like oh it's just these few errors you know those are easy fixes and I'm like yes that mm -hmm. for me is is it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how do you deal with um difficult authors authors um, who don't take your advice or you know, honestly, I've been really, really blessed. I think I've not had really any difficult authors. I had I had one experience with a difficult manuscript where it needed a lot more edits than we expected that it was going to need. And, and it was more that the author in that case gets feeling like, oh, it's overwhelmed. Like, how do I do this? How do we, how do we work through this? How do we... And, and so, you know, it's a lot of trying to be encouraging. It's a lot of realizing we don't need, you know, we're just going to work on one piece at a time, one, one section, one page at a time, and we'll work through it because you can't let yourself be overwhelmed. And there's, there were times that um, an author maybe didn't know how to do something that was being asked of them. So then it's, it's a Zoom call or it's a phone call or it's, you know, a lot of back and forth emails trying to explain the process and give good examples. But I think, I mean, I know that there's those stories out there of authors who refuse to do what you ask them to do. I've not had any authors like that. <laughs> so I, I feel really lucky that, that that's been the case. I've had really people that were very willing and happy to do the work 
maybe didn't always know how. So then that's an opportunity for me to to share what I've learned. And if I don't know, I'll find out and and we'll figure it out, you know. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> I escalate. I can't yeah. if they don't want to listen, even though I've given them reasons why this doesn't work or what is the expected standard. Um, I escalate to Cassie. Mm -hmm. It's nothing else. If you're not going to listen to me as your editor. Yeah. And I'm not for you. Yeah. 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 Take yeah. it to the top. <laughs> well, and that, and that always is the option. I mean, and, and authors, you know, from our standpoint, authors have to understand that. Like if, if you can't work with somebody, I mean, let's look at this from a different perspective. When when my book, my first book was getting published, I had an editor who at the time, she's no longer with Champagne Books, but the one of the first editors that I was assigned, um, she was really, it took her months to get me three pages. Like we're talking literal months. And then she wanted me to rewrite the whole entire beginning like it wasn't even recognizable what she wanted me to do and it didn't feel right. And I felt like it was changing my voice. And, and then she did things like she asked, um, could I read her manuscript that wasn't published and give her feedback? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I can't. <laughs> and I had to go to Cassie. So sometimes whether you're the editor or the author, if you're, if your editing author relationship isn't working, for whatever reason, sometimes you do have to go that step above and talk to the person in charge, you know, and say, hey, this is what's happening and this isn't working and this is why. And it's it's hard to do that. It's really hard to do that. Yeah. I was scared. I'm like, I'm probably not going to get my book published now, but I cannot work with this person, you know, right. and come to find out she was doing that to other authors, too. It wasn't just me. And so then, you know, she's no longer with Champagne Books and I ended up with a different editor. I actually had Cassie for an editor on my first book. So, oh, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. right to the top. You know, and yeah. that's that, that's something I see a lot of um, editors and, and agents talk about in the writing community is, you know, if you're lucky enough to have an agent to to not be afraid to go to them and have those hard conversations. And, you know, your agent's job is, of course, to to go back to your publisher and have those conversations. But if you're self-repped like we are, right. um, to, to, you know, if you if you get the opportunity, like I did to have a conversation with your editor ahead of time and make sure you jive, it's it's mm -hmm. so important. And if you, if you don't, if you have an assigned editor to still communicate with them as best you can to, you know, have a relationship where you can talk. And if you don't, like you said, Jody, it sounds like, you know, maybe don't be afraid to, to let the powers that be know so you can get someone who can serve you in your book best. Mm. Right. Well, and I mean, I would always send an introduction letter to authors that I would work with and I would let them know, here's what to expect. Here's how we're going to work. Here's what to expect. Here's my role in things and here's your role. Like, here's what I'm going to do and here's what you're going to do. And I think, I, I don't know, did you find that helpful, Kenise? Because I very, felt like very, that was helpful, helpful yeah. and and I think it starts things off on that good side of communication. Uh, and, and the way we work together, the the way we work through chunks of stuff um, mm -hmm. so that it's you don't get the whole novel back and it's a, a total wreck. Um, I mean, just getting the chunks back with, with Jodie's comments, you're like, oh, oh, I'm never going to be an author. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but because it's a chunk, you, you think, well, I can work at this, you know, just every just every day, every step, and and just work through it, and then we get the next chunk and we do it again, and that's that's fine. Um, so I I think the way that we work together was was really good, and that's when I'm working with other editors now, I like to say, well, can we do it this way? Because <laughs> it works. Well, yeah, it I think works. working in chunks like that, it also keeps both people working and moving forward. So, mm -hmm. you know, because when you have like eight weeks to get a book edited, start to finish, you both need to be working. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I like to do it that way because then I could send a piece of it and you could be working on that while I start the next section and then I'm working on, you know, then I send that and then you're working and I'm working and, and it makes it so 
by the time we get to that last section, I'm only waiting a week or so to get it back. And then I can do another read through and see what we still need to do. And it just felt like a more efficient way to work too. Mm. I do the mm. same. I don't like to, I'm always got too much on my plate. So the idea that we were only doing three chapters now for this, this author and three chapters for that author and three, you know, right. so it's, it's just, it's it allows me to breathe. Yeah, I think it's I helpful. would agree. Yeah, I think it's it, like Kane said, it's helpful um, also, too, because and I like that CBG does, CBG does this for us. They give us a pre-edit workbook of things they want you to do while you're waiting for your editor to become available to start the content edit, because, you know, same with like Jody said, you get a chunk or through the pre-edit workbook you know that there's progress happening and knowing that somebody else is working too, you're not in it alone. And that's, that's right. the great thing about the way you and Seth do it is, you know, I'm working here, but I'm not by myself and I'm not wondering, you know, what's going on elsewhere. Cause I know you're working too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure we have time to talk Hannes about your book, her holiday fling because I'm really fascinated about this. It's a, according to your website, it's a reworking of a previous version. Look at that. The ball on the ball. Let me go back. Lovely. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I should have introduced, uh, I should have introduced the Salignac legacy before as well. Beautiful. That, that's the one Jody edited. Mm -hmm. This, this one, um, um, I had uh, another editor and in the end, Cassie, uh, worked with me to finish this one off. So that's um, that's that one. That's the story of uh, Sydney's celebrity chef, uh, Vincent, and his encounter with um, a French holiday maker who was Angelique. And Angelique had all of her stuff stolen one night in the backpacker hostel. Uh, and so she has to go looking for work. And she, the only work she's got available to her is uh, her skills as a dessert chef and so she happens upon Vincent's restaurant um, and things um, move on from there um, don't want to give too much away um, so Vincent's goals I guess is that he wants to take this business his famous restaurant and franchise it to other um, capital cities in Australia he's that's his focus and that's where he wants to go but he also wants a companion to do that with, uh, like his parents did. Angelique, on the other hand, wants to go back to France to win her Michelin star and become well-known in her own right. Mm -hmm. They can't have both. Um, then they have a complication that the thief who stole Angelique's stuff is found dead at the bottom of um, the cliffs in Coogee. And Angelique, because all of, all of her stuff is with this person, is the prime suspect. So they have to work through that wow. before anything else can move on and then there's a whole lot of other complications anyway it was an interesting one to rework given that it was first published in 2017 um then i got the rights back when i got the rights back from that um cassie accepted it uh, for cbg which was was wonderful from my point of view mm. Wow, that's amazing. Did you have to like resubmit? Did you query it? How did it come to CBG? Um, I just wrote to Cassie and said, I've, I've got these two books. Um, have, I've got the rights returned on these two books. Are you interested? And she said, yes. Um, she hadn't read them, I don't think, which meant that uh, when we came to re-edit them, there was, as Jody said in this one and the other, a lot to be done because when I wrote these books, I knew nothing, nothing about goals, motivations, and conflicts. So rewriting it meant retrofitting those concepts into the story. Wow. How, so yeah. how did you learn these skills um, to, to do that for this revision? In the first instance, I would say um, the work that Jody put into Salignac taught me a lot about that. And then on top of that, let me tell you, the CBG pre-edit handbook taught me heaps mm -hmm. and, uh, 
and I regard my CBG editors, that's Jody and Debbie and Cassie herself, as exalted teachers. Let me tell you, I just suck up everything that they they teach me, which is wonderful. I might not it might not always show, but I do. I'm taking on board what they're teaching me all the time. I have I have extensive qualifications in my pre writing career, so. Um, but I've never done creative writing. So this is a whole new learning curve for me in my post-retirement years, and I'm loving it. But I'm well, and I can see well. from from the working on your first book to working on the bolio birthright, I could see the things you'd learn because you you put that into practice before. I even got the second book. <laughs> like when I started editing that second book, I could see that you had taken the things you learned and applied it because that book was a much easier, lighter edit than the first one was because you applied what you learned. And that's good. That's what we're supposed to do. It's fantastic. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. What would you say is the hardest part of rewrite? rewriting a book like that because that sounds like a rewrite that's not just a little bit of fussing um sitting down and actually working out what their goals were because I, I i'd written this story and my mother god rest her soul read it and she said it's it's a lovely little story now, for my mother, who read every day of her life, for her to say it's a lovely little story meant that it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> really, sucked. but I, I didn't know why, and she couldn't articulate why. Um, yeah. So, and it was basic. It basically came down to working out what their goals were, what each of them wanted, why they wanted it, and why they couldn't have it, mm -hmm. and then fitting that into if what I had to do was treat the existing story as um, just a note to self. And if there were parts of it that I could slip back into the story, fine. But as you said, it was basically rewriting um, the work so that it made sense in a story concept. concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes, there was a lot of relearning, a lot of um, new learning, um, but I think in the end it was a much more productive use of my time. It's mm. really cool because you you hear a lot of writers talk about um, how they they shelve a book or they they've written something or don't take it out there, and I, I hope that's encouraging. It's encouraging to me. I hope it's encouraging to other people to hear that you really can take that that manuscript off the shelf and and rework it um mm. I'm gonna throw you with this question but uh, well hopefully not throw you but um would you <laughs> would you have advice for somebody who's looking at their sort of quiet manuscript shelf and thinking about pulling an old one down and reworking it don't be precious about what you've already written mm. because it can be repaired but mm. sit down and do those things that that we were just talking about why do you why is the story important um why is the character important what does he she want why why can't they have it um is it is this why why are you writing this story and why are you writing it now um does it resonate with something going on in the world does it resonate with something in your life does it resonate with something that's coming in another story you've written or about to write um so, but you really have to be able to let go and say, okay, it needs work and understand that. I, I'm doing that for myself with another um, story that I wrote around the same time as these. And it's taken me about 12 months. I have actually sent, um, sent one version of it in to Debbie and then I said, no, 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 don't, don't read it. Give it back, give it back. Uh, because somebody else uh, had commented on it and I thought, I've got to hear it again. So I'm still working on this, this story. It might never see the light of day, but, you know, I'm learning again. I'm learning heaps because I'm using 
the uh, CBG pre-edit handbook. I'm using the information that I've learned from the editors along the way. Mm. Really, that's great. Um, since we're running out of time, I want to make sure we talk about Red Advent Adventuring Press. Can you tell us what that is? Um, th that was just a little press that I set up for myself, basically so that when I self-published something, it was actually published by Red Adventuring Press. Um, so far, it, it has had one publication, which was this one, Return to Clipso Station. Uh, and it's likely to be the only one. Uh, I, and, well, that's not true. I've got uh, um, a heavily erotic story that is is one of those off on the shelf. Um, I'll get back to her eventually. Uh, but if she, she probably won't fit the CBG... Um, Profile, we'll see. But anyway, if she doesn't, then she can go out with Red Adventuring. Oh. And where does that logo come from? Because it's really great. Ah, uh, right. Um, oh, yeah, I want to see the logo. Oh, you want the logo? Okay. Yeah, I want to see the logo. I didn't. I didn't catch it. You can't see it then you have to definitely go to her website because it's really cool okay. yeah there it is okay so um how that came about now i'm just looking around behind here oh yes i should i should have had them around the front to start with um so because i have an interest in crystals you might have gathered that from my trip down to the the garden that i mentioned before about the plants um i went looking for a crystal that um, would help me in this sort of um, journey if you like so red adventuring if you can see those mm -hmm. red, red adventuring um, it helps you to deal with distractions it helps you to go on to the path that you're trying to avoid and and it's meant to give you a zip in terms of your passion. So I thought, well, that sounds like the one for me. So <laughs> um, I went on online looking for um, things made of red adventuring, and and I came across the elephant and the angel. So I contacted my niece and and I said to her, well, I'd like a logo that incorporates the elephant and the angel because the angel would give me some divine inspiration and the elephant on the other hand once they start charging there's no stopping them so that was the whole <laughs> idea behind that and she came up with the logo incorporating um, them both with as an angel elephant and I thought well, that was just lovely so she's Aww. done a great job yeah, your crystals remind me I have one I keep on my desk to write. <laughs> oh, neat. It's a it's a carnelian is what this carnelian. one is. Carnelian, right. Uh -huh. And it's similar properties. Yeah, I keep it on my desk when I'm writing. <laughs> it's my worry stone too. Like I'll, I'll hold it when I'm thinking and stuck some, somewhere, you know. <laughs> yep. Yeah, neat. Yeah. Um, Anis, what would you say? And I'm sorry that we're rushing us towards the end here, but um, what would you say is the difference for you and your experience between a traditional publisher, you know, like CBG and doing it yourself? Uh, as a traditional publisher, you're not getting that support that you're getting from your editors. Well, unless you're prepared to pay editors to do that for you. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of self-published authors don't always do that. Um, but look I think you also need to look for advice. I mean, the here we have a Facebook group um, for indie authors, and on there, there there's a wealth of information. And you've got all of these authors who are willing and able to share their experiences, which um, publishing sites the best to use, uh, which editor to to look for. Um, funding opportunities that might be coming up, uh, competitions, all of those sorts of things. So that you, if, if you don't have the skills yourself and you're not prepared to go through the traditional publishing uh, route, then you need to be able to 
um, find that information, to use the knowledge that's out there, build your experiences based on what others have done and what you need to avoid. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's a really supportive community. They're not competitive. They're not saying, well, I'm not going to help you because you'll get more sales than I will. They, they're mm -hmm. really, they are really supportive. Wonderful women. Mm. That's great. Well, as we wrap up, can you ladies, uh, maybe starting with Canis, tell us where can we find you online? Um, my website is kineskerd-author.com, so C-A-E-N-Y-S-K-E-R-R-author.com. Uh, I'm on Goodreads. I'm on Insta as uh, Kineskerd. I'm on Twitter as at Kines9 and on Facebook, Kines Kerr Books and Goodreads. <laughs> Jody? They make us be everywhere, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'm on Twitter um, at Writes Jody. I'm on TikTok now, um, which is uh, Jody Jensen author, I believe. I'm new on there, so I'm still I'm still figuring it out, but I'm getting there. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I have a blog, Jody Jensen writes at wordpress.com. And um, I'm just everywhere too. I'm on, I have Instagram, but I'm not super familiar with it. So I don't use it a lot, but. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. We will put um, down below in the description section website so that you can find all of us. Please check out these wonderful ladies' um, books. There's some wonderful books there. Uh, don't forget to like this video, follow, subscribe. If you have any questions for Jody or Kenise, please put them in the comments below and we will try and get you answers and maybe even have you ladies back so that you can answer them for us in a video. Come back for more writing tips and tricks and have a great day. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.